Okay, so today I'll talk about uh, work from back back then that uh, has finally gone into publication. And uh, this work is called Hot Full. Um, at that time, I really wanted to name it Hot Full, but uh, actually my PI Lee at the time really objected it, but we still went with it anyways. And it's really looking at hot, hot phosphorylation site. And what that means is the phosphor site that are in proximity to cancer mutations on 3D protein structures. And today I wanna to talk about the study, but more just as an overall flow of how to outline a manuscript. And you know, there are different kinds of way of telling a story. Here is one possible outline of a computational biology manuscript. And it seems pretty generalizable. You can apply it to study A, to apply it to study B but I want to let you see how it might apply to a specific study. And I think this might help us in the future to plan better studies and more effect effectively conduct the studies we want to do. So I hope this is relevant to all of us in some ways. And so this manuscript kind of follows the flow of, you know, we first have a workflow where we develop an algorithm and apply that to a big data set. Once we have this workflow and algorithm, the algorithm is new in this case. And so we need some simulation and benchmarking. And once obviously after we apply, analyze the data, we will find some kind of new events, right? And these are say new molecular drivers of disease. In this case, new phosphorylation site, new mutations that are clustering on 3D protein structures. Finding things are great, but you know, it's not enough. And um, maybe it would be really helpful to think about what we can uniquely find in using this kind of new software we have, new, new workflow we have, this new analysis we have that are previously not found. Normally you hide that, that in a landscape view where you might have a hundred of those or a thousand of those. But among that, it will be helpful for the readers if you take out some exciting examples, the examples that may be previously known so that validate your algorithm and maybe other new findings that people previously couldn't find, but only available given your new data or new algorithm. Then once you have these new events, you can have ways that you can independently validate them and then finally find uh, different ways to validate this kind of events. And so here we're just taking hot flow as a case study to think about this and um, Let's look into how this is applied. To motivate the study a little bit first, uh, we first want to understand that, you know, as many, many studies in the past has indicated, this regulated phosphor signaling is really a hallmark of cancer. In cancer or in your cell, many of these proteins are tied together through pathways, and a lot of these protein to protein links are through phosphor signaling. In many cancers, as we have observed, the signaling basically have gone wrong. Maybe that there's increased activation signaling in survival proliferation pathway or inhibition signaling in cell cycle checkpoint pathway to make the cell go wary and really proliferate too much that becomes tumors. So we know that these regular signalings are important in cancer, but we don't really have as much understanding of phosphorylation sites. And even if we do, the phosphorylation site mutations, you know, are obviously very important in cancer, but they're often studied in isolation. So the studies that study phosphor sites, as you can see, for example, on the left, study phosphor sites in isolation from one of our prior studies. The studies that look at mutations, here you can see the hotspot 3D software uh, published by Bei Fang from Lee's lab um, in 2016, study mutations in isolation. And so in this case, they actually developed a hotspot 3D tool that map the mutations onto 3D protein structure. And they hypothesized that when these mutation cluster, that may need, mean that this domain is important for this protein's function in cancer. And the mutation that are right next to each other may help us identify new important drivers. So, you know, they're studied in isolation, but if we can put these two together, you can quickly imagine that if we have a phosphor site next to recurrent cancer mutations, that will be functionally important. 
And that's indeed what we set out to do in this study is to really test this biological hypothesis that if we have functionally relevant phosphocytes and cancer mutations, they will be really close to each other on 3D protein structures. Okay, so now we have this hypothesis. Developing the algorithm and workflow is straightforward since we have a hotspot 3D algorithm, or I guess in some ways it's not straightforward because um, the hotspot 3D algorithm actually have a lot of glitches in intersecting with the PDB databases that are constantly updating and Adam and Amila uh, has to make multiple updates to the hotspot 3D software for us to efficiently do this in the end. But basically, um, it's an algorithm where once you take the residues from phosphocytes and mutations, you map them onto PDP protein structures. And based on these protein structures, you establish a directed graph where you calculate the 3D distance between any pair of these residues, whether they're phosphocytes, phosphocytes, mutations, mutations. And then based on these residues, you then assign them weights and conduct clustering. So after the clustering, you can imagine you see the mutation only clusters, you see the phosphocyte only clusters. And for the sake of this paper, we focus on the hybrid clusters where the phosphocytes and mutations are clustering together. Okay, so once you have the cluster, you have to do some kind of simulation and benchmarking. In this case, we simulated uh, random phosphocytes in different residues and see how that cluster with mutations. They, in general, cluster with mutations a little bit less, where, as you can see, half are really enriched for these highly clustered mutation and phosphocytes. And uh, there's more simulation studies in the paper if you'd like to refer to it. But here's just you know, some general simulation benchmarking. After that, we look into what we found. And these are the key proteins that have a lot of these so-called hybrid clusters. And so you can see that we rent sort these proteins by the hybrid clusters and the number of fossil sites in these hybrid cluster mutations uh, or uh, hybrid clusters of protein structures. And they are of different amino acid residues, serine, tyrosine, threonine. Um, so you can see that they're here. And these are a lot of these top candidates are well known cancer proteins. So it's very important that we identify they have called clustering fossil size and mutations. Obviously, we set out to find things, we'll find something because we are scanning through the whole genome and protein. But it's important to highlight what we can uniquely find that previously are not found, right? So you can imagine that people previously have thought about this question and have already found, obviously, if they have a mutation right next to a fossil site, people will flag that fossil site. If you have a mutation directly on top of it, people will also flag it. But since we're using the 3D protein structure, we're able to find that if you look at these fossil sites and mutation on linear sequence, they might not be next to each other. But when you look at um, on a 3D protein structure, you'll find then co-clustering. And so we see, for example, this cluster containing these sites that linearly are really far from each other. And using linear methods, you have no chance of identifying these residues. There are hundreds of amino acid residues away. And so this is definitely something very important when you are designing your study and thinking about how to formulate your manuscript. And after you identify a bunch of those, uh, it's great, but obviously you want to highlight examples of the exciting ones. And here you can see that, for example, uh, if we just look into this red protein example, you see that we have these two fossil sites, uh, serine 904, tyrosine 928, co-clustering with these pathogenic mutations that are known in cancer and 918T, uh, for example, or 912Q. And so we think that maybe these fossil sites are important because these mutations are commonly happening in cancer. And previously, we wouldn't know so without doing the clustering uh, using Huffle. So we highlighted a bunch of these examples in the paper. And um, it's great to have these examples, but we also want to have other ways to suggest their functional importance. And here I highlight uh, analysis that Abkadir helped us help uh, conduct it actually using the DATMAT data set to look into, we have these co-clustering mutations of phosphocytes 
it's hard, hard to access the phosphocyte. But for the mutations, are they functionally important? And one way to find out is to using that map, if the cell lines have that mutation, does that um, signal the dependency on that mutated protein? And Kadir definitely see that um, being significant for many of the cancer types. And lastly, a lot of people think that the omics study find correlation, not causality. If you see these fossil sites and mutations, they might be there, but you know, without functional validation, we never know if they're important. At that time, uh, we worked closely with Gordon Mills and they have this data set that they were just about to publish uh, that include a thousand cancer mutations that had, they have cloned into these two cell lines and assess whether those mutations are activating, inactivating, or neutral. And you can see that for our co-clustered mutations, they're highly enriched for these well-known activating or proven fact activating mutations. Whereas if they're not co-clustered, the enrichment is much, much less. And this is very significant for proteins like PIK3C, GFR, and BRAF. So this is really showing that the cluster mutations with fossil sites definitely tend to have functionality in a in vitro assay. And lastly, we also leveraged the new CPTAC data set to make sure that these fossil sites are actually expressed at the patient's tumor, primary tumor. And we look into several cancer cohorts, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colorectal cancer, et cetera, and mark the number of patients that we see these phosphor sites that we have identified as co-clustering limitations actually being expressed or phosphorylated in many of these patients' primary tumor on key proteins like beta catenin, P53, P3R1. And so this serves as our kind of validation of the events we found. So that was a qu pretty quick uh, flow of the paper, but I want to just bring to your attention again that, you know, this kind of outline is generalizable and might not apply to your study, but I encourage you to think about it before you know you embark on a project and spend or wasted a lot of time to pursue things that may not actually go into the eventual story. And so in this case, you know, we had the algorithm workflow, we have a simulation and benchmark, we systematically reported what we found, and we highlighted the examples of what we uniquely find. Um, and then lastly, we use other ways to orthogonally evaluate the new events and provide functional validation of the new events. So I hope this kind of outline is helpful and you can see how you know in the Hotful study, it can be applied to a real world example. Adding on that, I want to talk about some lessons learned. And uh, these are things that you know we, I encourage everyone to do all the time is that you don't want to be in a place actually when you have finished the study to start outlining what could go into your project because what you'll find in that case is you often spend a lot of time traversing a lot of wasted efforts to pursue experiments or analysis that may not be needed and it's really helpful to know where you want to be and really do that as early as possible by defining say maybe a draft manuscript document by defining a draft figure plan document. And the second lesson is that it's important to do the difficult thing first. And this is called a swallow of fraud. And you know, in Huffle, our overarching hypothesis is that we'll be able to identify these kind of co-clustering fossil size and mutations on 3D structures. If we can validate in a quick example, you know, for example, a protein structure, we see definitely the mutation and phosphorus site right next to each other that are not close in the linear sequence, then we kind of test and um, validate that first overarching hypothesis. And that's very important for us to move on to actually pursue the project. Once you decide to pursue the project, I think the second most important thing is to be able to clearly define the cohort um, and the inclusion criteria for the samples and the data set you want to use first because Normally what we end up wasting a lot of time as well is also come back and refine these cohorts and data sets. And uh, personally, I have made a lot of mistake on doing this as well. So I think it's important to first quickly test if a hypothesis that the study 
approach will work mm -hmm. and then really seek to be as clear as possible on how you define your cohort, your data set, your key approach, your key resource needed. And lastly, you know, in terms of tracking the project, I think it's important, as I mentioned, to write it down maybe in the early manuscript document that can keep evolving. Keep track of all your results, obviously keep your files organized, but I think it's very important also to always have a result in say a PowerPoint that you track or a figure file you track to know what your main figures and obviously adjust your plans accordingly to what you have learned along the way. And so in sum, I think it ends with a famous quote that, you know, if you want to get somewhere, first you have to know where you want to go. And I really want to highlight the importance of knowing where you want to go. And obviously you can always work out how to get there and persist over that in the end. And so with that, um, thank you all for your attention and um, welcome any questions you have. Thanks. I can ask a question. Sure. So uh, when you test your first key hypotheses and uh, starting starting to build your results, how often do you go back and adjust your results? Like uh, how often do you uh, decide the direction of the manuscript? Yeah, so, you know, I feel like this is something that I actually haven't applied that much. I've always just uh, passed down and pursue the study in the end. <laughs> but I think I'm learning that, you know, sometimes it's, it's actually helpful to, to know and maybe kill some projects early. I think that's actually helpful because some projects will just never turn out to be as significant as you hope it would. And life is too short to pursue small things. So I think I'm learning to, to do that a little better. And I think, you know, we have actually killed a couple of projects here that I wouldn't right. have done in my older days. Um, but obviously I think refinement is almost always needed um, in some shape or form. The algorithm never works in the first shot. And most, most likely, especially if we do this kind of more systematic large scale analysis, most likely there are some bugs in the code in the beginning. And that can typically be known by, you know, some technical artifacts showing up in the data. Or I guess another example is that, you know, the examples that you know are gold standard controls that will show up, but then show up. So those are important cues to correct your approach. For the validation, I have a question. For the validation, uh, use the city type data, you use five cancer type. But there are more than five kinds of type of city tech data. Yeah, at that time, actually, uh, well, when we started the study, uh, which was 2017, <laughs> there were there were less than three, and there were more and more in the end. Um, we included at that time, I think, I think was a 2019 revision when we incorporated, and those five were past embargo. We didn't use extra. Yeah, but now obviously there are more and more as the day progress and you guys are using much more uh, than we did. So that's good. Thank you. Anyone has other question? Okay, I think we are done. So yeah, I think I end early, but uh, Make sure everyone attend next week. Sorry, we slack off. So I think we lost a little audience, but I'm sure we'll gain some traction back. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending us and we'll see you next week. <laughs>